Amen. Well, tonight we conclude our lesson in the Olivet Discourse. Uh, we're going to look at some barnyard animals and their symbols. Uh, we're going to look at some sheep and we're going to look at some goats. And we're going to ta uh, take a look at the difference between them and what they represent. We're also going to get some closing thoughts from Jesus in this message uh, here in Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 31 through the end of the chapter. Uh, as we mentioned the past few weeks, you can now watch our study online on YouTube at uh, youtube.com forward slash, again, crazy name, I know, BC Power Man, but anyhow, I uh, still haven't figured out how to change that name, but anyhow, we'll keep it for, for, uh, for right now. But anyhow, that's where you can go and find our lessons uh, online. In the last couple of lessons, we've examined some of the parables of Jesus as it relates to the end times. We spoke uh, last week of the parable of the talents. We spoke a week before that of the uh, parable of the ten bridesmaids. And uh, we, we kind of seen through all of this Jesus' connection to being ready, uh, one's readiness for the end times. We also seen the example last week of using our talents that, that God has given us and putting them to use. Well, in this final section, uh, it's kind of like the capstone, I guess you would say, of the entire message. Uh, Jesus exam it brings out some distinctions uh, made in the end times between the faithful who were called the sheep and the unfaithful who were called the goats. And so we're going to look at these two descriptions as we go through tonight's lesson. So first and foremost, if someone would, uh, someone read for us verses 31 through 33 of Matthew chapter 25. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus defines two groups of people, and he uses the Greek phrase pantata ethne. We get our word uh, ethnicity from this word, this Greek term ethnos, which means nations. And so what he's doing is he's describing people from all walks. He's describing people all over the world, uh, all nations, all races, all people from all societies, and he's grouping these people into two different categories. He's grouping one group by sheep, uh, which represents the righteous individuals of God, and he also represents the people by goats who are the unrighteous of God. Now, notice something very particular here that he, he mentions. On what side are the sheep placed in this parable or in this story? Yeah. On the right side, absolutely. When Jesus ascended, the Bible tells us he sat at what side of God's... The right hand of God's, of God's throne. In ancient times, most people were right-handed, and this is true in ancient times as well. Uh, to sit on someone's right hand was a place of authority. Uh, it represented a place of honor. But to sit at someone's left hand or to sit yeah, it was a place of disgrace, uh, wasn't a place of honor whatsoever. It was just almost like uh, you just got cast off, so to speak, if you were on someone's left hand. So uh, right hand was a place of honor, left hand was a place of disgrace. So you see already the distinction here between the faithful who are the sheep and the unfaithful, the unrighteous, who are in fact represented as the goats. Now let's do a little bit of a biblical background because as we mentioned the past couple of weeks, we need to understand the way first century people would have, un would have understood this. Uh, and they would certainly have understood this, this illustration of sheep and goats. Mediterranean sheep and goats normally graze together. So if you were sitting up on a hillside looking down upon a field, you may not be able to tell them apart from a distance because they all intermingle together. Uh, you, you had the sheep, you had the goats, and they all intermingled together. But towards the end of the day, it said that the shepherd would sit upon a gate and he would call all the animals to him. And what he would do is this door would swing in either one direction. It would swing either left or right. And what he would do is he would gather all of the sheep to one side and gather all the goats to the other side. And there was a reason they did this because the sheep preferred open air. Uh, they didn't like to sleep in a hot place. They, 
like me even in the middle of winter time, I've got to have a fan going. I can't stand it being hot and trying to go to sleep. The sheep needed their space, whereas the goats needed warmth. So sometimes the goats would even be confined in a small area so that they could uh, huddle together and be warmed by their body heat. There's something else that you normally see about this that people would have understood. By and large, sheep were far more valuable animals than goats uh, because of the wool, because of the meat. Uh, they were far more valuable than goats were. And that's probably the reason when we talk about a shepherd, it means a sheep herder. Instead of calling someone a goater, uh, we call them a shepherd, a sheep herder instead of a goat herder because sheep were far more valuable than goats were. So seeing the great value placed upon sheep in ancient times and the high honor in being placed on one's right hand, what do you think this indicates concerning God's thoughts pertaining to his children and about those who are not? What do you get from this already, these first three verses? Any insights? What do you think this stands for as far as uh, Jesus' description of the honor that sheep have as opposed to goats? This kind of plays into it, I, I think. This. Hand know what your right hand's doing, yeah. <laughs> you actually bring out a very good point, and, and as we, as we, right, and as we're going to see um, as we move forward in this, that. Um, well, I'll just leave it right there. That's a good question. As we move through this, this is going to make, I think, hopefully more sense. good point and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say this now because you both have brought out I think together what this means when you look at it together let me just give you a case in point a lot of people when they look at Paul they assume that he had a problem with James 
but really he didn't. They were very complimentary because Paul spoke of grace and James said, you know, you show me your faith, faith without works is dead. But they were actually bringing out two of the very same things in the whole big picture, you know, that were brought to faith in Christ. And uh, by being brought to faith in Christ, we, we can do good things. And I think, I think as we move through this, you're going to see both sides. I think you're both right in what you're saying. And I think all of this is involved in this process of separation that we'll see in a little bit. <laughs> Y'all must have been reading ahead. <laughs> uh, actually, this kind of goes in line. I mean, I, I really think the rewards mean something. Now, what they mean, I have no idea. I, mean, I believe heaven's going to be a very active place. Maybe it has something to do that, by what we're going to do for Him. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I definitely think it means something. And uh, this is getting good already. Uh, so let's take a look at verses 34 through 36 real quickly. Someone read that for us, verses 34 through 36. Sin shall the seed say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed God, my Father, and bear the kingdom of prayer for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you played with me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Okay, there's a very important point here we find concerning this, this core issue here. And uh, I just, just I come across in one of the commentaries, I try to use about three or four commentaries to try to get a good picture of, of a text as, we, as I'm going through this. And uh, one commentary said something about they thought there was a third group of people. I really don't see, I don't see that at all in this passage of Scripture. But just to let you know there are some who see this, I really don't see where there's a third group here because those who are on the right are accounted as the sheep, accounted as the righteous. And as we were talking about, some have thought, and some commentators have thought that the passage indicates a work-based salvation, that you can work your way into heaven. But that again kind of, we've got to kind of put it in perspective because, you know, Paul says, for by grace you're saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But I think a deeper reading of this passage of Scripture indicates what's going on here. And, and it's a very powerful thing we see here. Look what he says in verse uh, 34. You know, look what he says. You know, come who were blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So, you know, from the foundation, even from the very beginning, God knew who was going to accept. God knew, if you want to call it the elect, God knew the individual. So this is part of that salvation where uh, God uh, allows people to accept the salvation given to them by God. But by, by doing this, they are able to do good works. And in fact, this kind of goes in something, an a ongoing theme with what you see Jesus saying over and over in that a person is known by his fruits, you know, so to speak. So a person who is born again is a person who you'll see good fruits in. And, uh, and as you guys have mentioned earlier, that uh, that also means that uh, I think the more we do for Christ, don't know what it's going to mean, but I definitely think there's going to be something uh, in doing that. So you see kind of a connection here to one being transformed by the power of Christ and one uh, doing good deeds for Christ. Um, and so let's take a look at the righteous response here. Someone read verses 37 through 40 for us. Thank you. 
I kind of get the feeling here that uh, that when people stand before Christ and their good deeds are laid forth, I think we're going to have the expression this little baby has on its face. Wow! <laughs> you mean I, you know, you're actually going to give me a reward for this? And it seems to be the way Jesus represents this that uh, a lot of people are going to have things rewarded to them that they never even took an account of. I mean, we honestly think of doing something as... I mean, we, we have the idea, and this is no disrespect to anybody in Texas. i got a lot of good friends in Texas, but, you know, Dallas, you know, build it big, big it mighty, you know, build it tall. And we kind of have that impression, but, you know, I think even some of the smallest things we do for Christ are going to be rewarded. Uh, for instance, saying a prayer for someone in need. You know, that person may never know that we ever prayed a prayer for them, but that prayer may have been the thing that made a difference. Uh, helping someone out, um, just a simple, Janice cuts a lot of people's hair, just a simple haircut for a person, you know, a person in need. Uh, there's several things that we can mention here, just a, a kind deed, helping someone in a time of trouble, uh, giving an encouraging word or something of the sort. I mean, all of these, I think, are going to have and hold eternal ramifications. And so I think that he's referring here to the disciples that's indicating, I think, a relationship to Christ. And, uh, you know, and I understand and respect the fact that there are many different interpretations of this passage of Scripture. But I believe that the righteous here were, were sometimes not even aware of the works for which they were being rewarded. And I think for the righteous in Christ, we're going to have a lot of things we do for God that we never even took into account about how big he took that, how seriously he took that. So I think this should actually encourage us, even the smallest deed done for Christ, giving someone a drink of water, uh, giving someone a bag of clothes, uh, holds huge ramifications uh, whenever the rewards are given forth. Seeing the great emphasis Jesus placed on helping those in need, what do you think this should say to modern Christians? And and furthermore, to find an application here, how might we as Christians in our area help individuals in need? What are some of the needs maybe in our area? And uh, what do you think this says to us about the great responsibility we have as Christians? Any thoughts? There's a story I heard, and I can't even get the details of it, but it was something very similar to that where uh, someone spoke to someone, gave an encouraging word or something of that sort, and that person they spoke to was, was contemplating doing that. And I can't remember the details of the story, but uh, I just bring it up to say that that's happened several times before. And uh, even Robbie Zacharias, his testimony is he was on the verge of committing suicide at the age of 16 or 17. And uh, God got a hold of his life. It's just a simple word. You know, said to Any others?
Slack of it? Slack of it, yeah. <laughs> and what I mean by slack of it is when people get online and sign these useless whole support things. Slack of it, I mean, you're not actually being active, you just follow it. But I mean, just change the world where you're I mean, you know, you can help somebody for real instead of doing that. You know, I, I think that I fuck it challenge. Good point. Was it you or somebody else was sharing something today? And it's something about a guy who came to faith and he was covered with tattoos from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And, uh, you know, he, he came to faith and, you know, once they're on there, they're on there. And, you know, get, you know I guess you can remove them, but it's, you know, it costs a lot of men to do that. But he was, he, he was saying something that people were looking at him and automatically judging him. But once his life was transformed, you know, he was a different person. And that's definitely a good point to make there. Visiting people in prisons, visiting people... Uh, nursing homes, you know, there's certainly people who need, you know, a lot of support there. I want to give you a chance to have a lot of help. That's exactly right. And I think that's the mentality. That's a very good point. Right. Absolutely. Good points. Very good points. Someone read for us now. Now we've seen one side of the coin. We've seen the side with the sheep. Let's take a look at the other side. Uh, let's take a look at the goats. Someone, if you will, read for us verses 41 through 43. Verses 41 through 43. Jesus uses a very uh, strong word. Notice he says in verses 41, uh, you cursed. Uh, he, in the Greek, he's using the word, uh, and this is a mouthful here, 
kataraminoi, which means to, uh, it means uh, according to or having a curse upon someone's life, uh, to be cursed or have impending doom upon a person, or even in some uses of the term, I don't think it's necessarily meant here, I think cursed and impending doom, uh, but it even could mean casting evil upon uh, someone but, or something. So in other words, if how many of you have ever seen the movie uh, The Passion of the Christ? Everyone seen that movie? Do you remember the scene there where Ju Judas, uh, after he uh, sold out Jesus, he's chased by these little demon kids? I mean, they had all these different little weird-looking you know, looks on their face, these demon folks he's, he's chased around by. Um, what that's supposed to represent is the fact that you know, he had that curse upon him. Now, if you really think about something, and this is really intimidating if you think about it, you understand the favor of God, the grace of God. Well, the curse is the exact opposite of that. And what Jesus seems to be indicating at this great harvest at the end of time is, um, is that uh, there's this separation. These people here, the righteous, have the blessings of God. And those who do not have basically the curse of God upon them. And so Jesus also notes something very important and very interesting here in verse 41. Uh, that the eternal fire was prepared initially for the devil. and wasn't initially prepared for human beings. Now, we could get into some deep theology <laughs> and deep debate here. Uh, but Craig Blomberg, according to him in his, uh, in his, trend, or his uh, commentary... He says that he believes this shows a creative order of being, first of all, God's decree to create human beings, God's decrees to permit the fall of humanity, uh, God's decree to provide salvation sufficient for all to receive, God's decree to choose uh, those who would receive this salvation by grace through faith, and thus, in other words, saying salvation is sufficient and all, uh, for all, but uh, efficient for those who have received. Now, again, I know that's going to be a center of controversy, but that's the way Blomberg used it or looked at this. But nevertheless, however we work it out, what we see here is that uh, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. So those who receive and those who reject, I think what we find here, uh, do so according to the sovereign plan of God, but they also do so willingly. So I don't think there's a person... Um, in hell, so to speak, who would, um, I don't know what word this, who would necessarily have chosen heaven according to the way this looks, uh, you know. So um, let's be honest, I know some folks, I'm sure you do too, that um, it's a matter of pride, I think, maybe uh, to, to, to know that they can't do something for themselves, that they have to call upon someone else. And so uh, I think maybe that's part of it part of the problem there. But anyhow, someone read for us, if you will, verses 44 through 45 of Matthew chapter 25. All right, simply put, the unbelievers will ask, well, when did I, you know, you could look at it like this, when did I have an opportunity to receive, or they may ask, when did I refuse to do good works, or, you know, you've heard people say, well, I'm not really all that bad of a person, you know, I, you know, I'm not that bad of a person, I'm fairly decent. Well, according to what we find here, uh, they had opportunities to do these things, but they turned it by, they passed it by. And unfortunately, uh, we'll look in verse 46 and see the end result of uh, rejecting Christ, of, of, of rejecting Him. And uh, someone, if you will, read verse 46 for us. All right. Um, this has become an issue in our day and time. Um, there are various beliefs out there that you'll probably see. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of you may have even heard this guy. There's a guy out there by the name of Rob Bell. And he wrote a book called Love Wins. Anybody heard of him? 
Uh, he, he's on TV some, I think. Uh, he may have even been on the Oprah Winfrey show, I don't know. But, uh, but Rob Bell is his name. He wrote a book called Love Wins. And what this is, is he, pre pre he uh, presents a um, teaching about hell that's very different than what most of us uh, would uh, accept or most of us have probably heard. Well, there's a guy over here on the right you see by the name of Rob uh, Bobby Conway. I haven't met him personally, but I've seen him in a conference in Charlotte. He wrote a book called Hell, Rob Bell, and what it means, what happens when people die. And uh, both of them, I think, were bestsellers maybe by different groups of people. Well, what we find here is that there are about four different views concerning hell. And let's be honest, hell is not something that's going to make you the most popular person in the world if you start talking at it. Uh, if you have dinner with friends, and it's probably not the topic of dinner time conversation that most people talk about. But, uh, but it is a reality and we have to look at it. So um, there's first of all, there's four different views concerning this. There's what's called the eternal torment view. And this is what Bobby Conway presents in his book. And that is the view that hell is inescapable and endures for an eternity. For those in hell, it's an inescapable place. It endures for all eternity. And so that's the eternal torment view. The second view uh, that some people have uh, come up with is called the annihilation view. And this view is that people will spend a period of time in hell before being annihilated or destroyed. Uh, there's a good theologian in other aspects, John R. W. Stott, he held this view. This is, of course, the only, uh, he, he, in my opinion, went kind of off on this. But other than, other than that, he's dead on the money. But uh, annihilation is what is held by some. There's also what's called the universalist view, or I call this the timeout view. Uh, because if, if, has anyone ever seen a child have a timeout? Uh, well, you put them off to the side, you put them in their room, let them have a timeout, and after they get good and ready, then you bring them back out. That's what Rob Bell presents in this book, Love Wins. And this is the view that people will spend a brief time in hell, much like a timeout for a child, before being released into heaven. So in other words, in Rob Bell's view, everybody eventually goes to heaven the way he, the way he views it. Uh, and so there's the fourth view here, uh, which is called, the, I call it the rejection view, and some have felt that the whole idea of hell is a means of controlling the populace and thus reject the existence of hell entirely. But the most important thing we've got to ask is what did Jesus believe? What did Jesus teach concerning the aspect of hell? Uh, so let's look at a few things here in verse 46. Jesus obviously teaches the literal of existence of hell because notice in verse 46, he talks about those who go away to eternal punishment, but he also talks about the righteous going into eternal life. So if you reject the one, you then eventually have to reject the other is what you would have to do. Uh, Jesus literally speaks of, an, of a hell. He literally speaks of a heaven. So I don't think you can say, I think the fourth view is completely out. Also, he uses a term here in verse 46 in Greek, which is ionion uh, kolaisen. Kola, uh, Aeonion Colason, which means literally eternal punishment. And the word Aeonion is uh, used in John 3, 16, I'm talking of eternal life. You know, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting, eternal. Uh, that's where that word is used, life. So uh, this is either means uh, no beginning and no end, or it means no beginning, or it means no end. In other words, used here, he's saying that there is no end to this, and he also speaks of this collation mean, meaning punishment or torment, a correction or a penalty. So this phrase indicates that hell endures for all of eternity. And so um, anyhow, um, if a person would not accept him on this side of eternity, truth be told, then probably wouldn't accept him at any time. Some people would say, well... Yeah, but if someone's in hell, and certainly they would want out of there, well, yeah, they would, but does that mean that they would bow down at the feet of Jesus? I don't know if they would. Uh, so anyhow, therefore, Jesus' view on hell matches with the traditional and historic church view that hell is a literal place and, in fact, endures for all eternity and is not to be taken lightly. Uh, so with that in mind, why do you think individuals have sought to reinterpret hell? And uh, knowing the severity, also knowing the severity of that place known as hell, 
why does how does this affect and influence one's views on evangelism? Uh, so how do you how would you answer those two questions? say people seem to make it more about what they desire it to be instead of what, you know, in fact Jesus presented them. That's a very good that's a very good point. Very good point. for us guys to say special to our wives. <laughs> it pains me whenever I have to say it to Jennifer, I was wrong, you were right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More than I care to admit. <laughs> even worse because you're talking about and that's a very good point because you're talking about a spiritual heaven and a spiritual hell now which like you said the, the hell of now is like a holding cell well when all of this takes place and there's a resurrection we've got a physical body a spiritual physical unity and uh, the blessings we'll have with that body that can't be destroyed in heaven will be reversed in a body that can't be destroyed in, in hell so um it's a very good point. Very good point. Now, now say that again. Where people are still that they to heaven and well, the, 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 and you're going to see this as we start in Revelation, which we'll begin next week on that. Um, there's going to be a grand, what the Bible seems to indicate is there's going to be a grand resurrection of all people. So, uh, as Paul talks about, you know, once we pass for the Christian to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord, the Bible also talks about Hades, which is a like going back to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which is like a holding cell, you know, as Chad just mentioned, like a holding cell. Well, when Christ returns and all this goes down, there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and a resurrection of the unrighteous. And so for those, and I think this may be part of what he's talking about, I can't prove that, but there's a separation, a split here of the sheep, those who have resurrected with bodies will go into the, the new heaven and new earth, which we'll learn about. And uh, those who are resurrected uh, without Christ or without salvation, they'll have the lake of fire as their final 
to their final demise. So uh, as we go through Revelation, especially the last section, that'll kind of come out even more. That's where I figured they would be in I think once it's done, yeah, once it's... Yeah. <laughs> the last tease. Yeah. I think that there is a, a Hades, which is like the holding cell, so I do think that there is a spiritual version of that but the final Gehenna the final lake of fire that's that's yet to be that's yet to come yeah and in my opinion and and <laughs> I've learned great humility in a lot of stuff the more I've gone through theology. Um, in my opinion, I think what we, what, what we see is, I mean, for instance, Jesus tells the man on the cross, looking at the positive side, he accepts Christ and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, that paradise would be like that spiritual heaven uh, and then the Hades would be like that spiritual holding cell, so to speak, like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But once that final resurrection goes down, the physical, spiritual unity is going to take place, and so, like a body we have now, it's going to be an internal body. Uh, one side, the sheep, to experience the bliss and glory of heaven, and on the other side, the goats, the unbelievers, to experience the eternal lake of fire. And uh, so, at least that's that's my take on it, my humble take on it. <laughs> Good stuff here. Any others? Well, my watch is beeping at me, so I guess I need to move on here. All right, in conclusion, uh, here's a picture I found online uh, showing the sheep and the, and the goats. Uh, uh, the one in blue represents the sheep there. The one in red represents the goats. Uh, in this lesson, we have seen the distinctions that will be made between the sheep, God's righteous, and the goats, the unrighteous. And let's be honest, the blessings of heaven will be incredible. I mean, it's going to, get, it's going to be good for us in that spiritual heaven, but it's going to get even better in that new Jerusalem as we go through the book of Revelation. And as we were talking about earlier, many of you even mentioned, and I'd agree with you, that one's good works will be rewarded. Uh, how will this happen? What will this mean? I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, I have no idea. Maybe it's a certain type of particular job we have in heaven or maybe it's a I don't know what it may be but it's uh, I think there's it's going to mean something and the curses of hell will be horrifying in my opinion and, and people may disagree with me I think that there may be different even uh, kind of levels of punishment in hell I can see um, someone who um, you know never accepted Christ they were rebellious we they may have a certain type of penalty but picture Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Pol Pot and individuals like that. I mean, I think it's going to be, the fires are going to be burning up a little bit harder in that area where they are. But, uh, but I think these things matter. So this lesson should serve as both an encouragement and a warning to us, encouragement to know that God will right all wrongs and will reward the faithful even for those smallest things that we do when we think no one else is watching. In fact, no one else knows about it. God is, and God knows about it, and so we'll be rewarded for those things. But there's also a warning as to the severity of punishment awaiting those who find themselves without forgiveness on the day of judgment. So I think it's kind of a double-edged sword here, uh, so to speak. So we're done with this section. It's time, if you want to call it the main event coming up next week, uh, we're going to look at the book of Revelation. We're going to look at the first chapter as we see the vision of the Lord and John's vision of the Lord and uh, get ready to go through this. I will tell you, as we go through the seven churches, we're going to kind of slow down in that section and take it church by church and look at the particular uh, good things coming to some churches, bad things coming to other churches, and kind of go through that. 
as we uh, go along. So anything else before we close? I know that one group sung about a highway to hell, so I don't know. That's the only thing I, I was thinking to myself, oh, you're going to be sadly mistaken. Uh, well, if there's nothing else, uh, Brother Chad, would you mind closing us with a word of prayer?